All right. Everyone ready? How many of you uh, came from Stephen's fire hose? I mean, talk. <laughs> All right. Those of us that have seen Stephen present uh, for years know how uh, overwhelming it can be at times. Um, so my name is Julia Cartwright. I work at National Instruments. Um, I'm also one of the stable real-time uh, maintainers, as Stephen had mentioned in the last presentation. Um, I've been involved in Linux for about 10 years, involved in the RT project for about six years, I think, at this point. Um, I, I uh, maintain one of the stable releases, actually two of the stable releases, as, as Stephen mentioned. Um, but I've also followed the Linux RT users list. So there's a mailing list, feature kernel.org. Uh, this is a user list where a lot of people talk about the issues that they've run into. Lots of bug reports happen there. Um, and from this information gathered over years, um, it's pretty clear to see that there are, are different classes of bugs um, that uh, our users, the preempt RT users, are running into and reporting um, that are issues in, actually issues in device drivers. Um, so th the purpose of this presentation is to present these uh, issues as they exist, and I'll talk about some of the features Stephen mentioned, like local locks and so on, um, as we go along. Um, so how many of you are actually running preempt RT in production right now? I would have expected more, honestly. So how many of you are like uh, evaluating it as a potential future RTOS platform? About the same. OK, that's interesting. All right, well, maybe I, I hope you will find this interesting. Um, how many of you work on upstream device drivers within the community? Great. You are kind of my target audience. So uh, if anything I say is unclear or you have any questions, um, please ask. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, a class of systems that we all run into. If, you, if you're defining, uh, Designing an embedded system that has, uh, um, yeah. Oh no, they don't see my slides. I don't know how to. Uh, have we not switched? Aha! On that one. Nothing over here, though. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> Great. So now we have them up now. Yay! Thank you. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to describe uh, a class of what I'm calling mixed criticality systems. So most complex embedded systems might have, might run two different types of tasks. You're going to run uh, tasks that have some real-time requirements, some latency, bounded latency requirements. Uh, then you also might run some non-time critical stuff, um, you know, doing basic monitoring or, or disk or, or maybe not even any I.O. or you have some throughput tasks, whatever it is. Um, uh, those two need to run together, maybe need to communicate with one another. Um, it's mixed criticality in the sense that there's two different uh, uh, degrees of, of time sensitiveness. So one way you might actually design this is actually split it up uh, into two different hardware devices. You might have uh, like an ARM Series R core on a board and you deploy all your super time critical stuff there, or maybe you're using like an FPGA or a CPLD. Um, you're pushing all your super time sensitive stuff uh, onto a separate hardware device. And then on, on like an ARM A-series uh, chip, maybe you're, you're running Linux, a full Linux stack. Um, um, so this is, this is one of the models. However, it has some downsides. Um, it's expensive per unit cost. Now you produce a board, you have to have uh, you know, two different sets of hardware accomplishing two different things. Um, if there uh, is interaction between the mixed criticalities, like crossing the, the domains, now you have to define some communication channel between the two hardware. Um, pieces that's up to you to define, um, but you do get really good isolation. So the stuff that's happening on the non uh, real time Linux side isn't influencing your time critical stuff. Um, so some might choose this different set of trade offs. Um, if you look at something like Xenomai, I don't know if you are all in, in Jan's talk uh, today. He was talking about Xenomai, and it's it's uh, it, it follows this hypervisor. I think they call it the co kernel approach. Um, it's effectively like uh, you you run uh, a, a separate operating system within the realm of a, uh, well, I'm going to call it a hypervisor here. It doesn't necessarily have to be a hypervisor. There's AMP solutions where you can partition, like, okay, these, these cores are going to run for ERTOS, and these are going to run Linux. Um, I, again, there's, there's uh, trade-offs to be made about usability um, and communication between these uh, mixed criticality systems. Um, Preempt RT sort of has chosen a different path here. Um, uh, systems that run preempt RT are sharing 
um, the kernel, they're sharing a scheduler, they're sharing a device uh, stack, all the subsystems are being shared. Um, so you, you don't get as much isolation, um, but you get a lot of usability benefits. Um, applications can just use standard Linux IPC mechanisms to communicate. Um, it's effectively like uh, thinking that um, the traditional Linux process isolation model is good enough to isolate real-time tasks from non-real-time tasks. Um, and, uh, but like I said, the driver stacks are shared between them and uh, therefore the drivers can misbehave. Um, and so uh, I'll talk about ways that uh, they can misbehave. But first I wanna talk about latency. This is what I'm gonna call the delta. This is what we all care about. Um, if you care about real-time guarantees, you have um, a time at which an external event occurs. Maybe it's an interrupt firing a timer or some IO device saying, hey, I need um, to be serviced. The time it takes from that event to occur um, uh, until a, the relevant real-time task actually executes. Um, this is my bound of defining, uh, naming delta. Um, most of you should already know this if you care about real-time systems. Um, real-time systems will try to characterize and bound this in some meaningful way. Um, so this is how, this is one of the, the example techni techniques that the RTE community, especially the preempt RTE community uses to characterize this delta. Um, so this is a super simplified version of a test we call cyclic test. Um, so cyclic, cyclic test is pretty simple. All it does is take a timestamp and it sleeps for a fixed duration, say like 10 milliseconds, and then takes a timestamp when that thread is, is woken up. And if you take the difference between the, those two timestamps I've collected, uh, that's the amount of time that the thread actually slept. And then I'm expecting to sleep for the duration, so I can subtract that out, and that difference is that delta. And so if you uh, plot that in a histogram, it can look something like this. Um, so in the purple is actually just a, I ran this on my laptop, this is like the regular config, config preempt uh, setting in a mainline kernel. This is what you would see the, the latency samples look like. You can kind of see the distribution has a really long tail. Um, I think I only ran this for like a minute and I saw a 342 microsecond spike. It's not a real time operating system, so you know that's to be expected. Um, and the green is on the same hardware system. Um, this is the uh, preempt RT patch. You can see that it has in that same duration. I don't remember how long I ran it. Um, you can see that it has a max bound of 60 microseconds. Much more well behaved for real time use cases. Um, so if you, if you think about this delta and what is contributing to this delta, uh, I break it down into two different uh, phases. So there's a dis IRQ dispatch latency. Um, this is the amount of time it takes between the hardware event actually firing to the interrupt, or for the relevant thread to actually be woken up, to, for the, the um, interrupt dispatch to have occurred and the thread, the scheduler, the thread scheduler being told, this thread needs to run. That latency, I'm, I'm calling uh, this lowercase delta IRQ dispatch. And then the second one is scheduling latency. This is the amount of time it takes. Now that the scheduler has been made aware that this high priority task needs to be run, the time it takes from that moment to the, to the um, CPU being given um, that task to actually execute, it being scheduled in on that CPU. So these are the two phases that I'm defining for the purpose of this conversation. And I'm gonna dive into each one of them individually. So I'm gonna start looking at um, IRQ dispatch latency specifically and sort of talking about all the causes of this uh, latency and, and issues we might, might see. So um, this is mainline model. So one of the main contributors to this is actually long running interrupts in mainline. So in mainline because Interrupt handlers are executed in hard IRQ context. Uh, they are uh, implicitly executed with interrupts disabled. And so here's this diagram, the scheduling diagram, like you might have seen before. This is all mainline, again. Uh, X-axis is time. We have some thread executing in user mode. At some point, there's some interrupt that fires. Say, for example, it's like network, and you don't even care about network in your real-time application, but eh, it happened, interrupts happen. Um, and then at some later time, well, at the time that that event occurs, the CPU is gonna vector off into hard interrupt context and start executing the handler associated with that network device or whatever device it is. Um, and say during the duration of that interrupt handler, a high priority event that I care about, I'm here calling this external event that I care about more, say that it fires. 
Well, it's not actually able to be scheduled on the CPU until that low priority interrupt um, is done executing. So if you, if you and, and any, this, this delta here between this external event firing and that red task executing, that's a direct contributor to um, the, that uh, IRQ dispatch latency, as I mentioned. Um, and it should be obvious without the real-time patch, if you want to try to define bounds on this, well, it would be a mess, um, because the bounds would be the bound of, of the longest running uh, uh, interrupt handler in the system. The longest running interrupt handler is going to be informing what your worst case IRQ, uh, IRQ dispatch latency will be. Hopefully that's made clear. Um, and then at the point your task, or your, the, the uh, interrupt handler will execute and wake up your uh, real-time task and, and everything's good. Um, this is mainline. So on, um, on RT, when you, when you apply the RT patch and actually enable the RT patch, um, and, and Stephen mentioned this as well, what we do is actually force IRQ threads. So what this means is that there's actually very little code that we actually execute in hard interrupt context. Very little, they're just little shims that execute because they have to. And all those little shims do are wake up these threads that are, that are um, going to be executing your handler, um, if that makes sense. So you might have some low priority task running, um, you have some not unimportant IRQ that fires, but only a very small portion of time is actually spent uh, just waking up the associated handler thread. Um, and the duration of that shim can be well understood. The bounds of it can be well understood um, for real time purposes. Um, and it provides other guarantees um, such that because it's now running and executing in a thread, those threads can now be preempted. So if I then have my higher priority RT critical interrupt firing, um, that IRQ thread can be scheduled um, immediately. So that actually reduces that IRQ dispatch latency. Uh, does that make sense? Or pro provides a more uh, easily characterized bound. So that's how that works. Now for you as a device driver or developer, um, I have some good news. This is just gonna happen. Like we are going to be, uh, when, you, when you enable RT kernel, it's gonna force IRQ threads. So Steven alluded to this. Thread IRQs actually exist in mainline right now. You can boot a kernel and pass the thread IRQs parameter and uh, it will thread all your interrupts. Um, so this, a, a significant portion of this infrastructure is in place. The things that aren't in place for RT is a forced enablement. Um, so that's good. Um, it's good except when it's not. Um, so for, and there are cases where it's not okay. Um, it's not okay when your drivers are invoked as part of interrupt dispatch. So if you actually are, are invoked in the process of delivering uh, an interrupt, then you can't be threaded. Um, so the things that fall into this category are IRQ chip implementations. Um, those are important to not be threaded. Um, so if you're a, a device driver author working on IRQ chips, uh, keep that in mind. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that's all I really had there. Um, it's also not great in the case where you uh, can be invoked by the scheduler directly. So there are a class of device drivers in the kernel tree right now that can be invoked by the scheduler itself. Things like CPU freak, um, these things cannot be threaded. So if these drivers are requiring interrupts, then you need to be registering these interrupt handlers with this extra flag. So if you use request IRQ, request threaded IRQ, there's a flags parameter, this IRQ if no thread is what you can pass to actually cause the interrupt core to not actually thread your interrupts. So keep that in mind. The fortunate thing is the vast majority of you, I would hope, are not working on CPU freak drivers, not working on IRQ chip implementations. If you are, then I'm willing to help you out if you have problems. So please, send me an email or send an email to the Linux RT users list. Um, so that is uh, talking about uh, implicit interrupts being disabled during uh, interrupt uh, handler execution. There is a different, another class of interrupts being disabled that is explicitly disabling interrupts using local IRQ disable or local IRQ save. Um, device drivers should not be using these things, um, but they are. In fact, I think I did a grep. There's about 80 users um, of these APIs in the, in the drivers portion of the kernel tree, um, which is, I think, manageable. It's something we can actually go through and audit each of these and figure out what they're doing. Um, but to give an example of why this is problematic, I would hope you would know at this point, um, but it's problematic in the case that the external event 
can actually, it, once it's fired, it can't actually execute the interrupt handler because interrupts are disabled. And so it doesn't actually execute until interrupts have been re enabled. Yes, question. Yeah, so that's, that's a question. So, that's, so it's a great question. The question is, what is my definition of external event? I should have been more specific. What I mean by this is a hardware event, whatever that means. It could be a timer IRQ that fires. It could be an IO device that says, hey, please give me a sample. Uh, depends on what you mean by priority. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. So when I when you call local IRQ disabled, the, all the interrupts are disabled in the local CPU, correct? I'm sorry. Ah, uh, the same level. Okay, so you're referring to a hardware prioritization of interrupt features, right? Um, so. I don't actually have a complete answer to that question. I'd be interested to hear about how you're using that feature. Because um, um, talk to me afterwards, because I'm, I'm interested in that question. But yeah, uh, I'm not assuming a hardware prioritization of, of interrupts. Um, this is all purely a software dispatch, IRQ dispatch. Um, but great question. Um, so there is a lot of questions I have. Like I, I told you, there's like 80 instances of this being used in the driver's portion of the kernel tree as of 414. Um, I said don't use it. Uh, of course, I can't make that like really strong statement. Never use it. There are situations where it's actually required. Again, if you are absolutely going to be executed in hard interrupt context or you're involved in interrupt dispatch in some way, that's GPIO, uh, IRQ chip implementations, or IRQ chips. Um, those sort of things, it makes sense to use local IRQ disable, maybe. Um, but uh, it could also be that it's just buggy. For, for example, the, dri the device driver is, uh, wasn't written with SMP in mind, and so there's assumptions being made um, that the interrupt's always going to be uh, delivered to the local CPU, and uh, so it might just be buggy. I'm hoping that there's very few of these. Um, I haven't actually done a complete audit, but it needs to be done at some point. Um, and uh, probably the most common usage here, and Stephen alluded to this as well, is that it's kind of a heavy-handed way to prevent the tasks being executed from being ripped away from the CPU. So if that task is, is, um, uh, needs to access some per-CPU data, um, uh, this might be one way that the driver uses that. And uh, there's a solution for those people that's using local locks. Um, so there's a question about local locks in the last section. Um, this is what local, looks, local locks look like currently in the RT patch. Now I should be, uh, I should make this clear. This is a feature in the RT patch currently that in the next few months will be proposed for mainline inclusion. Um, but here's what the API looks like. You, do, you use this uh, define local IRQ lock uh, declarator macro. Um, and then within your function, you can replace uh, local IRQ disable um, and local IRQ enable with these local lock IRQ and local unlock IRQ. Um, and if you don't build on RT, these will end up redirecting to local IRQ uh, disable. And when you build with RT, um, it provides the following guarantees. So writing your device driver, these are the semantics you should be um, expecting from these APIs. The semantics are as follows. Basically, um, what it prevents is two different tasks running on the same CPU um, from running in the critical sections at the same time. Uh, this is a, uh, we looked at the, at the semantics that, that drivers are typically uh, requiring for these, this sort of uh, synchronization model, um, and that appeared to be what is really required for a lot of P for CPU accesses and so on, and local IRQ disable. Um, and so, um, if these are the semantics that are good enough for your driver and, and what guarantees you need, uh, then local IRQ lock is a good fit. I'm not going to go in each of these in details. Um, but uh, under contention, there's a, a, a mutex in place. So there's pr uh, proper priority inheritance um, and so on. Again, if you have questions about this, you can send an email to me or Stephen or the Linux RT users list um, because sometimes the semantics can be a little complicated. 
um, but uh, it might be a good fit. So some of you might be wondering, okay, well, I don't see a lot of local IRQ disable, local IRQ enable calls in, in the driver's tree, but what I do see is a lot of these functions. I see spin lock IRQ, I see spin lock IRQ save. What's going on with them? Well, it turns out when you enable RT, if you do spin lock IRQ, interrupts are not disabled. We just ignore it. We just use it like it is a spin lock, or in the RT case, it's mutex. Um, and we just ignore the hint that says, also, please disable interrupts. And we can do that because interrupts are threaded. And I'll talk about spin locks a little bit more when I talk about uh, scheduling latency. So now I enter into a, 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 a different set class of problems that still um, cause this um, IRQ dispatch latency. And so this is a unique situation that we've, we continue to run into, run into on our products. And uh, so I'm making device driver authors aware. Um, so to give you a little bit of background, I was running a cyclic test, pet, uh, test on, my, on my desk, and I had an Ethernet cable running to this box. And it was one of those Ethernet cables where the RJ45 connector, like the little plastic pin was broken off. You know, you've always dealt, all dealt with this, I'm sure. And uh, the test was running, and I bumped the cable out. I got up to go get a cup of, cup of coffee or something. I bumped the cable out, and I plugged it back in, and there was just this massive latency spike. And I was like, what the hell happened? Like, I just wanted coffee. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so we did a lot of debugging, and it was very confusing. Um, but we eventually figured out what the, what the root cause was. Um, and it's something that you might actually think about. And I'm asking you to think about it. Um, so here is ba the, basic, the basics of what was going on. So the device, when it was being initialized, when I was unplugging the cable and replugging in the cable, as soon as I plugged in the cable, the, the network interface went up and down. And as soon as it went up, uh, or it went down and then up. When the interface went up, there was just a bunch of register writes to like some configuration block and this particular hardware device. And then there was a read, and the read was like, okay, well, I wrote all this configuration data, and now tell me when you're done doing your configuration, whatever. Now, on this particular device, there was a pretty, um, it was a, a PCI device, and PCI uh, uh, writes are posted, so they're effectively buffered in the interconnect to be delivered to the, to the device. And that read that comes in is gonna push all of those writes out of those those uh, store buffers in the interconnect until they get to the device, and then uh, it's gonna return the, the read response back to the CPU. Um, but the thing we've encountered is that um, the CPU actually cannot dispatch interrupts until it gets that read response back. So then you see something like this, where you see, okay, I've seen this thread, it did a bunch of write, 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 and then it did a read, and it just like, was waiting for those buffers to propagate down to the device and for the device to do its thing and then to come back. And in that interim time, uh, the timer had fired for the cyclic test thread and it can't be serviced because architecturally it's required that um, in interrupts are delivered uh, in that particular instruction uh, order. So there's some order architectural constraints in the hardware that requires this ordering and so therefore interrupts won't be, won't be delivered until the read completes and uh, so, and not, when, once that read completes, then the interrupt can vector off, um, but you can measure that latency, and so I did. So this is one, this is the test prior to me uh, bumping this cable out. Um, and uh, so you see after this test run, you have a max worst case latency, 17 microseconds. Not that bad. And then I wrote a test case that all it did was just do write, 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 write. Like it picks a PCI device, a memory bar that I knew was gonna be safe, and just like pile down a bunch of writes and follow it by a read, and then, and then measure the latencies. And this is what I get. So this spiked all the way up to 100, that's like a 10, 10x spike here uh, to 174 microseconds. That's pretty atrocious. So uh, the lesson is don't bump my uh, ethernet cable, I guess. Um, <laughs> but the question is what do we do about this? Um, and uh, what am I asking you as device driver developers to consider? when you're authoring your drivers. What I would ask of you is to consider this case where there's buffering in the interconnect. Um, what we actually did to solve this is actually follow each write by a readback, and that actually prevents the, the writes from being stacked up on, on one another in the interconnect. It's kind of a crappy solution. I wish there was a better one, um, but it's what we have available. Um, 
Do you have any other ideas? That'd be great. There, I, I've, I've heard mumblings that in some of these CPUs, you can have some uh, buffering, at least in the CPU complex itself, uh, construct timeout, uh, control timeouts in the store buffers and so on. Um, but that just seems like a lot of architectural black magic. So uh, question, yeah. Yeah. I agree. This is where the uh, throughput and latency considerations just, I mean, they, they come at one another. And I don't know what the right solution is. Um, maybe the right solution is to provide a, a higher level accessor that's like a, a Rydell with readback. And then like if you're building an RT, then do the readback. Otherwise, don't do it if you're not building for RT to bound that latency. I mean, I don't know. We have options. I don't know where they are. Yeah, the enemy is hardware. Yeah. So the, the solution to this class of bugs is to take, your, take the drugs away from the hardware people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, speaking of drugs and hardware people, um, some additional MMI woes, as I call them. Um, We've seen this uh, not, not just buffering in the interconnect. We have one device uh, that we've seen that actually will enter into some lower power state. And then when, when an MMIO transaction happens, um, it will like exit from that low power state. And that exit latency can actually be measured on the CPU side. Um, so again, take the drugs away. Or at least ask the hardware people to provide some knobs that you can tweak and say, oh, don't go into this low power state, please. Um, uh, secondly, uh, another thing we run, out, run into is like this, I think it was like some spy EEPROM that was just memory mapped. It's, it's a terrible idea, but it was done. And uh, don't do that, please. Um, <laughs> so that's all I had on, on IRQ dispatch latency. Any questions there? Otherwise, I'm going to talk about the other phase. OK. So at this point, uh, you have a thread that has been to this, you've told the scheduler please execute this real-time thread. And from now on, I'm counting the, the time spent from that point to, the, to that RT thread actually being scheduled in as the scheduling latency. And I'm going to talk about causes of, of uh, or potential causes of uh, the scheduling latency. So to show you one, of, one such example, this is very similar to the local IRQ disable, local IRQ enable um, case. But this is instead the set of accessors that disable preemption on the local CPU. So just to give you what that looks like in the diagram, so you have some thread executing. It does a preempt disable. Um, and an external event happens. And the, the, interrupt, it, the interrupts aren't disabled. So it just it executes immediately. The CPU vectors off into this interrupt handler. The interrupt handler is going to wake up this high pri higher priority thread. But it can actually be scheduled in on return from interrupt um, because preemption is disabled. And so you have to wait until that thread has done a preempt enable. And at that point, you can schedule in the higher priority thread. So it should be clear that usage of preempt disable, preempt enable are going to um, impact that, uh, that delta. Any questions about that? The only reason that I can come up with after, after thinking about this, and maybe you can think of some other, other ones, but is that. Uh, why a device driver should be using uh, preempt disable, and that is if you need to synchronize with the act of scheduling itself. If you don't fall into this category, then you probably should not be using preempt disable, and you can use local lock as, a, as an alternate solution here. And I, I did a grep. It wasn't that bad. Um, I think it was only like 60 users in the driver's tree. So not that bad. It's not like we're talking about analyzing you know, 100,000 spin lock critical sections or something. Um, so it's, it's manageable, auditable. Speaking of spin locks, however, um, on mainline, when you do a spin lock and spin unlock, on mainline, um, preemption is actually disabled. Um, so if you look at a mainline execution trace and you want to look at these, uh, these latencies, um, you see the same sort of behavior. Um, the way that we solve that in the RT case is uh, make spin lock uh, critical sections uh, preemptible. 
uh, and uh, we do that by turn the, turning them into PI-aware mutexes uh, and disabling migration as a little semantic quibble. Um, but uh, in that case, when spin lock, when a spin lock is being held by a thread, it can be preempted by a higher priority thread, and uh, so therefore you can uh, bring in that uh, that outer bound. Any questions about that? That's a the you have to think about this for a while. Think about the spin locks sleeping for a long time before it's like, how is that even okay? Uh, uh, and if you combine sleeping spin locks and forced IR key threading, you're gonna have to have both of those pieces together and think about them together to understand how they actually work and are successful for preempt RT. So if this is unclear to you, I'm happy to talk about it afterwards because um, it's definitely uh, confusing. And again, the story is pretty clear. So if, if you are writing a device driver um, and you're using spin locks, then you're not really going to impact uh, a, a RT thread priority um, or RT priority thread. Um, so you're just lucky. Now again, it works until it doesn't work. Um, and so if you're in the situation where you do need to synchronize with uh, some code running an interrupt dispatch, um, or uh, things that can be invoked from the scheduler. So example, for example, like the, the, spin, the, the scheduling core, um, all of its spin locks internally are raw spin locks, um, and raw spin locks are traditional spinning locks under contention. Um, and uh, if you use the, the raw spin lock API, which looks pretty much exactly like the regular spin lock API by design, um, before you consider doing so, um, think about the cases where you might need to. I need to do this because I am invoked from hard interrupt context. I'm involved in interrupt dispatch. I'm involved in scheduling. That's a good, good enough justification. But think about it when you were doing it um, because you need to think about the critical sections themselves and you want to ensure that they are doing the absolute minimal amount of work possible and especially that it's bounded because any critical section is gonna impact that worst case um, uh, delta. So please keep that in mind if you're gonna do this in the future. Um, and uh, again, we're always happy to review things, or at least I am. Um, so in conclusion, these are the four things I hope you walk away with. So the first one is if your drivers aren't involved in interrupt dispatch, then you probably shouldn't be using local IRQ disable, you probably shouldn't be using local IRQ save. Um, look at using local locks. Um, secondly, just consider MMIO accesses. I don't have a good story here, just to think about it um, and see if you might get away with um, doing readbacks um, that might be suitable. Look at your own applications to see if you can, um, yeah, I don't know. There's, I don't have a really good story here, but just think about it. Um, if your drivers aren't involved in scheduling, uh, then you probably shouldn't be using preempt disable. Um, and uh, instead use, it, use uh, per CPU accessor. So the RT patch also introduces a, uh, a, a different set of per CPU accessors called get local, CP, get, local, get local CPU and get local, or something, and put local, lo local var, yeah. Yeah, get C, yeah, local var and put local var. And those are access primitives that allow you to do per CPU access that only disable, pre, uh, only disable migration and don't disable preemption. That might be an option for you. Um, if your drivers are involved in interrupt dispatch and scheduling, then you need to use raw spin locks. You can't nest a regular spin lock within a raw spin lock. Um, that's bad. Um, in fact, we've, we've discussed it for a long time about making that trigger locked up splats right now in mainline um, so we can catch these issues. We haven't done that yet. Um, but uh, it's possibly coming in the future or certainly coming in the future. I just don't know when. So, uh, I ended a little early and I have plenty of time. Um, so if you have questions, please ask me. If you have questions afterwards or want uh, clarification, you can reach me at julietni.com or julietkernel.org or my Twitter handler or Linux RT users list. That's actually a great resource. Also a great resource is the Pan Linux RT and OFC. So, uh, we have a, all the cool kids hang out, I'm told. I don't know, do I fall in that category? I guess so. Uh, question up here.
Yeah, so that definitely falls into the category of, oh, sure. Yeah, so, so um, yeah. Yeah, so this, this uh, gentleman mentioned that he had also run into what appeared to be some MMIO, or MMI woe, as I like to call them, um, and uh, where he was saying uh, you trigger an erase cycle for a flash, and then when you read the status register, it blocks in the pipeline until it's delivered. Yeah, that certainly, definitely falls into that same category of thing, and I don't know what the right answer is, um, but yeah, that would, and then he said PowerPC also suffers from, from this pipeline stall. So yeah, I don't know what the right answer is. Yeah. 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 I'd be interesting to talk if you had solutions for that. I don't know if you did or not. You did. Okay. I'd like to talk about that. Maybe afterwards. Um, there's a question in the back here. If you can get the slides, yes, they will be up on the uh, on the scheduler page after this talk. Also on my Twitter feed if you need them before that. Uh, question. So, um, so the question is, and, and the question is, how does IRQ threading work? So let me describe a little bit more about how it works, and hopefully that answers your question. And then if it doesn't, uh, please ask again. Um, in order to support IRQ threading, it requires the use of the IRQ chip primitives as implemented. So what actually happens is when the interrupt fires, we jump into that little shim as I showed. Um, the shim actually will mask the interrupt at the interrupt controller. Right, so the device is still asserting it's interrupt because it hasn't been handled yet, but it's been masked, right? And then we wake up the, the associated IRQ thread. Um, and uh, if that IRQ thread happens to be the next highest priority thread to be executed, then the scheduler is gonna execute it. And on the tail end of that handler, after the associated handler is executed, uh, right before the thread goes back to sleep, it actually will do the unmask. Okay, so the question is, what, what happens if you have two real-time, like real-time events happening or interrupts happening uh, at the same time? Um, well, it, if that occurs, then it's up to the user or system integrator to properly prioritize those interrupts. Because you're now in the realm of scheduling, you have all the tools available to you in that realm, like adjusting priorities um, or adjusting scheduling class even. Um, you can adjust these to be like round robin or FIFO or Deadline, even I'm sure. I don't know. The key thing is that the uh, interrupt threads are or the, the interrupt handlers are threads. I mean, just like any other thread in the system, you can yeah. do whatever you want. Yeah. Uh, you might want to take this for a mention of, of uh, request hierarchy threads. Oh yeah. So there's there is um, uh, a a function called request threaded hierarchy. So there's two main registration functions. There's request hierarchy and request threaded hierarchy. So on mainline, how this works is, is the, the traditional ones request IRQ, the handlers are invoked in hard interrupt context. If on mainline you use request threaded IRQ, you actually specify two handlers. One of those handlers is actually what's executed in hard interrupt context, and then that handler can return IRQ wake thread, and IRQ wake thread will actually wake the associated IRQ thread that will actually run in thread context. Um, so that's how it works in mainline today. So RT, the way this works, is it actually will force thread the, IR, the hard IRQ handler and the IRQ thread. Well, force, no, force thread is actually in, in mainline. In mainline as well. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I didn't get your point, but go ahead. Yeah. 
Yeah, so threaded IRQ is, is also kind of a, a generic work deferral for interrupt handling, so it falls into that category. So there are mainline uses where it makes a lot of sense um, as well. So thank you, Stephen. Um, there's a question in the back corner. OK, great. Question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if that's true. I think we'd have to look. Um, I believe this was changed uh, in the past several releases because there were device drivers that were doing, uh, trying to acquire a spin lock in their top handler. Um, I don't know that we did. We can look at, I will absolutely look afterwards if you want to, but, uh, or, or Stephen's going to look right now, but I believe that the, even the top handler is threaded uh, in RT as it exists now. Yeah. Yeah, there is. Yeah, so task, Tasklet is, is one IRQ work. So the question is about, is there anything special about Tasklets? Um, not really, only that if you raise the Tasklet soft IRQ, it's associated with the thread in which you've raised it. And so when that thread is done executing the handler, then it will start executing the soft IRQs that were raised in that thread. So therefore, in that thread context, right, you have your IRQ thread, it's executing. It will execute the handler that has been force threaded. That handler is going to raise the, the Tasklet soft IRQ. And at the termination of the handler, it's still in that thread. It's going to run the task thread right then at the very end. In the, context of the thread. in the context of that IRQ thread, yes. And that's true of all, not just task lists, but that's true of all software, soft IRQs that are raised in thread context. Yeah. Question. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the question is, doesn't this break? Uh, any device drivers that might be involved in the real-time portion of this of an application? The answer is, it depends. Um, um, you might see higher latencies because now there are more context switches, um, but you should get better bounded behavior um, for those. And, and you have to also do all the configuration necessary to actually get these things prioritized with respect to your RT app application. Um, but uh, maybe, I would hope not. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a pretty tight bound depending on your, on your system. Four microseconds is pretty, pretty tight. I don't know if you'll hit that. Yeah, so even on the, the highest power, like Xeon system that I've tested on, I'm still seeing like 10 microseconds, worst case execution. Now, on the ARM systems we have, we see maybe 25, 30 microseconds. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and like I said, like for those really tight bounds, and uh, Jan mentioned this before in his presentation, is if you need those tight bounds, uh, you might choose a different strategy. You might go to using Xenomai. You might spin up and push all this stuff into another hardware unit that you can offload. Those might be solutions. Or maybe it's not possible on this particular platform. I don't know. It really depends. Any other questions? Olaf. Was this, was this just a general statement? Because yeah. I agree. OK, so for debugging this? Yeah, so, so first of all, I'll repeat the, the, the statement that Olaf made. He says that uh, uh, debugging priority uh, inheritance problems that exist between a real-time application uh, and an uh, interrupt thread um, can be painful to debug 
what techniques can be used to debug them. Um, I typically just use the standard sketch timer trace points. There's sketch a timer and IRQ are the typical ones I enable, but it's really just slogging through some uh, traces and figuring out what's going on. That's not an ideal situation. Um, there was a uh, conversation yesterday I had that was a little bit interesting, um, which was that it might be possible to leverage something like, um, well, let me let me back up a little bit. Um, there are on Zenami, apparently, I, don't, I haven't used Zenami much, but uh, for a, an application, you can have it such that if that, if that real time application actually invokes a system call or something that, that exhibits known um, unbounded, uh, un unbounded execution behavior, it is sent a signal. And then that task can either figure out what it wants to do, dump state or core or whatever, as an application debugging tool. Um, it should be conceivable to implement something like that using SecComp in Linux. Um, so I'd like to pursue that as like a usability, debugability tool, especially for people that are taking applications from non-Linux platforms to Linux. Um, but yeah, I would agree with you in general. There's a, it's, there's a debugability problem. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the comment is even if we chose some seccomp based solution, it's going to be difficult to maintain because there's going to necessarily be a blacklist or whitelist that we use to determine whether or not a system call is allowed or, or not allowed, but exhibits beha certain behaviors or doesn't, and that's going to be a difficult thing to maintain. Um, maybe it's going to be good enough for just application debugability. Might not be u useful to actually enable it in deployment. Um, so I think there's, there's, there's some trade-offs we can consider there. Any other questions? Otherwise, again, I'm happy to answer questions via email. I do review patches. Just let me know. Great. Thanks. Thank you.